Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week, can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is proudly sponsored by Topping Technologies and Express VPN. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see your founder released twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, you see, that's a joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about their privacy? If you are, then perfect, ExpressVPN can assist. Even though 96% of stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does give 100% guarantee via their 30 days back money guarantee. Now, without further ado, I'm proud to say today I'm interviewing Harley Frank, who is the desktop engineer and one of the largest semiconductor distributors in the world. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you, Toppy, and I'm appreciated to be here. Absolutely. So winding back the clock a couple of years, how did you first get into IT? Um, I started when I was young. So my stepfather and my grandfather started a computer business, and I was infatuated with it. I shadowed my dad for a long time, and uh, he showed me the ropes. I took apart PCs. I fixed PCs. Um, by the time I was like 9, 10, I was building websites. Really? Uh, yeah. And then where you're fixing PCs pre Google Brave, you can't just search the internet with the answers. How do you find the answers back then? Uh, so I was one of those weird kids that would like to read books all the time. So yeah. my dad is like, here, read this or here, read that. And it was just like all these weird computer books. And some of them are, I guess he's like, Hey, this is what I'm learning in college right now. And it was like a CCNA book. I still have that book on my bookshelf. Oh, really? <laughs> And I look at it all the time. I went in a completely different direction, but I always wanted to follow in the same footsteps as my dad. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Do you remember your, what was your favorite book called? Uh, well, it was, well, that book, it was just the, the how to CCNA, uh, it's like, the original Cisco books. Oh yeah. The yeah. ones that was like uh, red and yellow. Oh yeah. Now, now they're like small and they're white and they have the, um, flashcards in them oh really yeah oh yeah uh i got the portable command guide uh, as soon as i got into college and they've upgraded it since i was like i think it was on like version three now that's like version five or version six. Oh jeez. yeah <laughs> uh cisco has grown since then just a bit just a bit <laughs> yeah. uh Ch-ching for the splunk acquisition a couple months ago <laughs> that actually was surprising i thought that was just a few for the renewal <laughs> right um so yeah when i got out of high school um i went to college tarrant county uh did three years there wanted to go into network support network security i guess didn't really make it there uh i took one semester of uta and due to uh unexpected circumstances i ended up having to drop out and i kind of just found my own path, I guess. Uh, I'm, what I studied in college and what I'm doing now are two totally, completely different things. I, feel, I see that topic and that trend more and more. It's like, oh yeah, I went to college for X. Do you ever use X? No, not really, but, nope. <laughs> but I still pay for it. <laughs> I actually do not have college debt. Oh, that's, nice, congrats. That's the one thing, uh, other debt for sure, yeah. but college, no. Yeah, well, the other, I was gonna say the other debt's a lot easier to get rid of too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so after dropping out of college, uh, I had a couple of odds and end jobs, retail jobs, that kind of thing. Uh, and then my dad ended up having to, when he closed the business, uh, when I went to college, mm -hmm. uh, he had a friend that had his own business, his own startup MSP, I guess. And, uh, he hired me on and I stayed there for about a year or so, uh, getting my footing, getting my reins, trying to figure out the help desk life. And then, yep. uh, it was really fun. Uh, what really inspired me to go in that direction is because I like helping people yep. like any way I can. Uh, I have a philosophy of is, uh, knowledge is only good if you use it. If you store it away, it's useless. I mean, it, it's priceless. I mean, Knowledge is knowledge. You shouldn't have to pay for it or anything else like that. So if I have the knowledge, I'm willing to give it to you. 
uh, you know, without expecting anything in return. Yeah, absolutely. So MSPs are a lot of the same way. It's a bunch of people that get together that have random different knowledges and you either learn from each other or it's one of those things. It's like, I don't know exactly how to do that, but my friend over here, he does. So let me transfer you over to him and he can help you. Exactly. It's, you know, small businesses, they don't have the luxury of in-house IT. So they uh, essentially have to pay a premium. Oh yeah. But you know, if you have the knowledge and you can provide the best support an MSP is a really good direction to go for. And it, it's a real good way to get experience fast. Absolutely. I might be a little bit, a little bit biased for my tech company, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not for everybody. Oh yeah. Um, and, but it's also, if you're looking to get into it and you have no idea where to go, mm-hmm. <laughs> look on LinkedIn, look right. on indeed, look at, companies that are offering the MSPs yeah. that are uh, have positions open. That's a real good way to get in. I mean, basic level technician. I mean, you don't need, I always think of uh, customer service, You c- customer service or technical sales. You can either have one or the other or both, mm-hmm. or you can have none of it. Yep. All of it is teachable. So if True. you're willing to take a chance and willing to learn all of that's teachable, you, I've seen some people like one of my best friends, he walked into it knowing nothing. And now he is almost like me as an engineer. So, yeah. uh, you can do it. It's gotta be hungry. Exactly. It's like, that's one of the most fun things. And it's also an upside of working at smaller companies. Usually kind of by just by the very nature of the beast, you'll have many roles, many hats to wear. So you're not kind of boxed into one singular task that you might have to do if you worked at a you know, huge corporation, but if you're at a small or even a, you know MSP, or if you're working as an end user, you're going to learn a lot and have that fire hose and learning method. You're going to learn a lot of different topics really quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the good things about MSPs is that the scenery always changes. I mean, yes, you have your day to day people oh, yeah. and I am still in contact with some of the people that I serviced. 10 years ago, give or take. Oh, yeah. Um, and they're just really good people. Oh yeah. Uh, you make a lot of connections really quickly. Oh, absolutely. You learn a lot. It's, it's a great opportunity, especially getting into it. Oh yeah. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, yeah, it was a small shop, uh, workloads did get high, but a lot of hours, a lot of hours, L- I, not so much sleep. Uh, oh, I mean, maybe got lucky. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't sleep much anyway. Yeah. So it's just <laughs> yeah. the nature of the beast, I guess. But uh, no, I like my boss. Um, I like the people that I work with. Uh, it was a really good experience. And honestly, uh, if I could turn back time, I would definitely go back and do it again. I mean, I'm an engineer now. I'm doing something completely different. But I would love to just go back and help people and just be in that scenario again. Absolutely, and it's immensely satisfying, you know, helping translate the ghost of the machine to you know, the real world scenarios and helping them out and helping the end user understand, you know, this is how we fix your thing, this is how we mm-hmm. make sure not have it again. And some people are especially appreciative about it. It makes it all worth it. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, what the position is and what you gain from it is insurmountable. Oh, absolutely agree. Um, so one, I mean, I don't really have any good worthwhile stories from it, but um, I guess the unique challenges would be was trying to get my footing. Like, mm-hmm. I have amassed of this knowledge. I mean, I have knowledge about a lot of things. I'm a jack of all trades. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's one of the things of sometimes you need to be a subject matter expert and other times you have to put aside certain uh preconceived notions in order to get the job done. Um, One of the things was uh, viruses. Mm. They always changed and and not, uh, there was no real way to actually combat them effectively every single time. So some of our customers, they would get infected and it, you know, I never had cybersecurity training beforehand, but Mm. after uh, combating viruses and figuring out and doing research on Reddit and forums and stuff like that, uh, it kind of got me, it's like, okay, well, maybe I should get into cybersecurity. Because oh, if yeah. I didn't know, guaranteed not a lot of these other people know. Oh, yeah. So maybe should push into that direction. Oh, yeah. It's 
as well, I may be biased as well, given what I do for a living, but it's one of the most fascinating things out there. It has the most variables, I think, of all of IT, where, don't get me wrong, infrastructure can be extremely complex, especially if you're building out something like a Netflix data center or something like that, but, or a Google, you know, you're in charge of the Google cloud infrastructure. But, I mean, how many server startup companies have we seen in the past five years? Like, you got Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you got Dell, you got Lenovo, mm -hmm. Supermicro. I mean, there's not a lot of server startups. Cybersecurity, you can't go 12 seconds without another company coming to the market. Oh, there's yeah. always new solutions and there's always more threats. There's always new threat vectors. I mean, it's fascinating. It's the ultimate game of cat and mouse, really. Uh, yeah, I, I recently went to a security conference uh, a couple months ago and I was there for other reasons. I was actually scouting out a vendor uh, for use in the company that I work with now, but uh, I, I met a couple of other people and it's like, oh yeah, we subcontract out with the government and we use uh, these X, Y, and Z tools. And I'm like, I've never heard of these tools. And it's like, here, they gave me a pamphlet. I'm reading it and I'm like, this is way better than anything I've ever seen. And I've never oh, yeah. heard of these people. Yeah. So some of them need a little bit of help with marketing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's also one of the most complex things is what's going to work and what's going to, what's going to fail. It's like one of my favorite books is Freakonomics. I forget the author, but they talk about how these certain products, every once in a while we have a product that's been around for 50 years and bam, will just skyrocket in popularity and they'll sell out everywhere. So it's kind of the same thing. Cyber, certain cybersecurity tools kind of fade into existence. Some are just in the forefront and spend more on marketing than I could possibly comprehend and everyone knows their name. Mm -hmm. but yeah, some of those startups, they, they kind of need to get their name out there a little bit more. They get bought out. Oh yeah, that's kind of that's kind of inevitable. That's that's a lot of those companies. Like, oh yeah, they're independent, not so much anymore. They're gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they're all their features are all rolled into the mat, the parent company. It's all all one thing. And sometimes it's for the better, and sometimes yeah. it's just okay. You just made a purchase to make a purchase, and now the product's no good anymore. Yeah, it's all about that integration. How it could actually be successful and helping the end user, making their life a little bit easier. And I, I wish more CEOs and more more CTOs and they kind of realize like that's kind of the biggest benefit when you buy a company is like, how can you add that to your portfolio? And just at the end of the day, make everything easier and better for the end user. Like that should be the core philosophy that drives every decision. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And then what kind of got you out of the MSP or what urged you to go into your next type of role? So, um, certain life events, I guess, uh, kind of wanted me to, or kind of helped me push me into a direction of where I should go. I guess it was just like a calling. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting scouted by a recruiter nice. to work for uh, a really known company that we all know of that's been around basically the father of the machine. Uh, that never actually worked out. Um, I was there for about a month or so and I didn't like it. Um, so I branched off and, um, again, I had this calling of wanting to help people mm -hmm. and, uh, I saw a job listing and, uh, Mansfield ISD mm -hmm. and I took a chance and they took a chance on me. I, I was probably like 21, 22. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. I was yeah. really young. And um, it turned out to be one of the greatest experiences that I could have ever asked for or even imagined. Um, yeah, it's local government. Um, it's public domain, that type of thing. But it was really fun. Really, really fun. Um, what was the biggest shock going from an MSP private sector where all of a sudden now you're in a public sector, you're working for the school? What was the biggest kind of difference that you noticed that you liked? So a lot of the different kinds of tape. So you, you get you hear often, oh, well, there's just a lot of red tape around it. Mm -hmm. Well, what they also don't tell you is that there's black tape, there's white tape, and there's yellow tape. And that all, it's like budgeting and finances. It's, um, it's like inventory or it's uh, things that we can do, things that we can't do, and things that we have to abide by. And so every, um, it was just basically like every portion of it was its own mini- uh, department, I guess, like even a school would be considered its own department. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to navigate that was a culture shock. Oh, I, I can imagine because it's not just one school building, it's multiple school buildings, multiple mm -hmm. classes. I mean, ISDs are huge. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mansfield ISD is immense. I mean, they have like seven high schools now and they have a lot of middle schools and 
That's intermediates lot. and elementary. So it's a lot of IT. A lot of IT. Um, and that's not including all the departments that they have too. Um, and all the people that they support. I mean, it's a well run machine. Yeah. Uh, the people that I've worked with and the people that I've talked to on a day to day basis and the people that I've actually supported, I mean, it wasn't just teachers, it was students as well because, you know, they had devices of varying natures. Yeah. So it was, um, a really awesome experience. I, I can't tell you, you know, a time where I didn't feel bad about my job. And then nowadays, do all the kids have assigned devices by the school and instead of a good old textbook made out of paper? Um, I don't know. It's been several years. Right. When you were there. When I was there, uh, it was a mixture mm -hmm. of devices and textbooks and stuff like that. I mean, they had computer labs too. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had schools that had state-of-the-art uh, technology at that time, mm -hmm. the STEM schools, which was really cool. Um, and even a lot of the high schools got retrofitted with newer technology and newer things. So uh, it was a mixture of a lot of devices for the students. And it was kind of awesome seeing how from when I started to before I just left on how big Mansfield ISD grew mm -hmm. and how um, just how an awesome place it is. Uh, the the culture there mm -hmm. I, i've never experienced a culture where it, you know how people say it's like oh, jobs or family oh, yeah. you, you your workplace it's your family it mansfield isd it's basically a village oh, really? <laughs> yeah uh everybody helps everybody i mean i i would go and on my off days to go and support you know do um the Christmas carols, I uh, can't think of the name at the top of my head. Um, was it a Valentine Christmas carols or was it a... No, uh, ringing the bells. Oh, oh, yeah, the, the music department. Or not the music department, the um, the bells department. No, it's... Uh, Christmas caroling? Donations, no. it was... Salvation the, Army? Salvation Army. Yeah, yes. that's that's the big one I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would do that. And oh, cool. So we had um, other things, other events, and I would go and either help volunteer or something like that because a lot of the stuff outside of school, it, they still need people oh, yeah. to help facilitate, to help manage, to help support, um, even if it's IT or not IT. And I loved Mansfield ISD so much that I was willing to give my all, basically. That's awesome. Yeah, it's one of those things where that's one of the biggest things that makes or breaks a lot of these companies is just the culture. Do you actually smile when you actually like going to work or do you just go there and you're kind of dead inside? So I think we everyone's had that point in their career where they, they have that job and maybe it's just the job security or the health benefits are good, but it's like it just doesn't make them happy and their coworkers are more like acquaintances or maybe going to the metaphor, they're like the distant cousin you see once a year, you kind of don't want to see at Thanksgiving reunion, but you kind of just tolerate them and be like, oh, hey, uh, Bob, how you doing? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I am happy to say that I've never experienced a job like that. I mean, I've worked several different types of jobs, even all the way through from like high school and through college. Yeah. I mean, I worked at a car wash for three and a half years. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, even even right now where I am, it's it's different. I mean, it's going from like an MSP to the public sector to now an enterprise environment. They all have their different things. I mean, it's corporate, so it's like your corporate family, but it's a different kind of culture. Um, what, what first inspired you to go from the, again, because that's a huge change going from the public sector. Now you're going to a, a private sector or a private corporation. What was that like? So I was scouted. So I guess word of mouth and of other things like I, I I've talked to the recruiters and I and every time I mean I talk to her on a weekly basis so Good. a whole bunch of other different things and oh, yeah. every once in a while I'll ask her I'm like how how did you find me out yeah and she'll never tell me <laughs> it's super it's secret super secret but uh, uh, she scouted me out we had a couple of really good conversations and then had an interview and. The interview was three hours long. I've never had. Wow, really? Never had a job interview that was like three hours long. Was it like a lunch or what? I mean, was no, it, a, was it, it a podcast? Was, I mean, geez, <laughs> <laughs> it was a Zoom call and um, it had 
a bunch of people on it from uh, different departments within IT and also a couple of people overseas because yeah. it was a, it's a global, global company. And it was just one of those things of it, it wasn't an interview. It wasn't a job interview. It was like, you know, sitting down, we're talking, they were, they were asking questions, I was asking questions back. It did get technical, yeah. but it was one of those things of, it was kind of like your first date. Yeah. It's like you're getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And it was an awesome experience. I've never had an interview like that. I've never spoken to like managers or leads or something like that in that capacity. It's always been like a formal uh, exchange or yeah. semi-formal exchange. Uh, and it was a really good cultural shift from the p public to enterprise. And uh, the next call that we had, it was like not even a week later. Uh, it was like another two-hour interview. Oh, wow. And that one was more of an actual interview. interview. Yeah. But uh, were, were they grilling you on like specific technical scenarios or concepts or yeah, what, what was it, it like? It was... Uh, it was devastating because I didn't know anything that they were talking about. Oh, really? They were asking me about technologies that I've never even heard of or even worked with. Yeah. And uh, I felt really bad because I'm just like, I don't know any of this. Yeah. And it wasn't until one of the managers stepped up and he said, that's okay. Yeah. We're trying to figure out what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. What you don't know, we can teach you. I like that. And it's so at that point, I was just like, OK, so this is more of how much how much knowledge do they have to transfer or basic basically is what that was. And it kind of made, made me feel better oh, yeah. uh, towards the end of it. But I totally felt I watched that interview. I was just like, oh, man, I, that was not my best. Mm -hmm. uh, I got inside my head big time. Was there one particular question that still haunts you to this day or really, sta really stood out among all of them? Um, haunts me? No. What, uh, pursued me to learn, uh, one of the engineers that was on the call, he asked me a very basic PowerShell question, mm -hmm. DISM. And I didn't know PowerShell at the time. I know it now. I yeah. use it on a day-to-day -day basis. I've built many of things in PowerShell. Uh, and I mean, there's, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not opening up a terminal and I'm typing in PowerShell or I have VS code up. I mean, VS code is always up. Mm -hmm. I have things always up. Um, but he, he was asking me about DISM and he's like, do you know anything about this or anything else like that? And DISM is a really good tool for a lot of things. You can use it to break ISOs or images. You can use it to uh, restore a computer's health. It has a many different applications and it's a really simple fix. Your computer is running slow or you're getting weird pop-ups or errors or something like that, or something's just not right. Yeah. Okay, you could run System File Checker. That's okay. It may fix it, may not. But what DISM does, uh, it, the clean health and restore health, is it basically checks to make sure that the integrity of the Windows machine is correct. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, it'll go and get the right files and restore it. You don't have to reset a machine. Mm -hmm. You can do everything from, you can do something basic to restore your computer's health and to work in order. Now, if you have viruses, that's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if you're just using it and, you know, you don't do anything virusy, mm -hmm. uh, that's a simple fix. And that works 90% of the time, just right. like rebooting your computer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we say reboot your computer. We're not joking. It's, like, that'll it's, fix it. Just re re tell the end user it's basically magic. It, it just every once in a while, just resetting it, mm -hmm. it'll actually solve a lot of things. <laughs> Windows is built... Um, to basically cache a lot of stuff. And so Windows 10 and Windows 11, it's the one thing, that, well, Windows 8. One thing that I really hate about it is how much it caches. And there's settings that you can do to turn it off to where it actually does clean shutdowns, clean boot, boot ups, but it makes it faster by caching things. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't reboot your computer 12 days, 15 days, 30 days, yeah, it's going to be slow because it's cached too much stuff and yep. it hasn't had a chance to clear it out. Mm -hmm. 
one reboot and it's like it's brand new. Yep. <laughs> and then what was the biggest shock once you joined the company or what was the kind of biggest pleasant surprise and what was it like? Um, the biggest shock and still the biggest shock is imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I had a quote from somebody that's no longer with us. He, he told me that if you are not experiencing imposter syndrome, then you are not doing something right. Oh, really? Yeah. And IT imposter syndrome is part of the daily life. I mean, there are things that you are not going to know. Yeah. Everything changes, but you have the ability to learn. You have the ability to acquire that information. And if you can't, for some reason, there's somebody else that has that information. So right. you can say, hey, uh, I need help with this. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to do is asking for help. True. And so, yeah, there are times I walk in, and I'm like, I feel like I don't know any of this, but give me five minutes. And I'm like, okay. You start figuring it out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So um, the biggest culture shock was not knowing when I first started, not knowing anything. And then, I, you know, I've been there for three years now and yeah. it's just like, oh, yeah, that's easy. Just give it to me. I'll get it done in an hour. Yep. Or it's like, yeah, uh, that'll take me a couple of weeks. I'll, I'll get that done. Mm -hmm. um, or it's uh, building something completely from scratch. OK, let's get on a call. Let's talk about it. Yeah. And it's like, well, we've never done this before. And I'm like, neither have I. But let's talk about it. Yeah, let's hammer it out. Yeah. So with all the class of resources you got there, you can absolutely make it happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I hear people all the time. It's just like, oh, I can't get help from anybody. I can't do some of these things because these other people, they won't do their job. It's like I, I don't experience that. Yeah. I send an email or I send a Teams message or I send an invite and uh, anybody is willing to help. Uh, there's one guy that got hired on for a completely different role and now he's transitioned into a new role. And I, I text him all the time. I'm yeah. like, Hey, I'm trying to do this. I'm getting this error. I've already tried to figure it out on my own. I have no idea what's going on. And he's like, can you send me the GitLab link? I'm like, okay. So I send it to him and he's like, Oh, here's your mistake. You did this when you were expecting this. So you should do this instead. And then that should fix it. And I'm like, that took you all about five minutes, didn't it? <laughs> and he's like, yes. <laughs> well, it's all about different perspectives. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's how you solve those problems. It's like, you have two people look at the same picture, view it entirely differently. And sometimes it just takes that different perspective to fix it. Oh, yeah. Um, perspective is everything. Um, the hardest part, and if there's any knowledge that I can transfer on to anybody that's listening or something like that that wants to get into a higher form of IT, whether it's programming, software development, engineering, or cybersecurity or networking or something like that, is you have to uh, leave your blinders at the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, you have a horse and you put the blinders on that helps the horse keep calm and stuff like that, but it gives you tunnel vision. So, yeah, it's okay to look directly ahead of you, but also at the same time, uh, you need to see the picture as a whole. Uh, you have a project. Okay, plan out the project. Go A, B, C, and D. Like yep. where, you, where you're starting from, where you want to go. The middle stuff you can figure out as you go, but you need to figure out the road you want to take. Mm -hmm. And that was the hardest lesson for me to learn. Oh, really? Because I, I wanted to see everything that was in front of me. Yep. Yeah. But I could never see past what was in front of me. Yeah. But now it's like we have a project and stuff like that. We'll go into a conference room. We'll whiteboard it. Yep. I'm like, okay, so this is what we want to do, A, B, C, and D. If it's uh, something that we need to do in PowerShell, if this is something that we need to uh, work with other teams on, if it's some internal software development that we can get with the software developers or something like internal in the company, it's like, okay, we know what we need to do. How do we get there? So we plan it out. And so we write down who we need to integrate with. We need who, what services we need and how to do it. Okay. Yeah, that's our A, B, C, and D, but which order do they go in? We yep. won't know until we start asking questions. Absolutely. And Gotta be able to improvise too. Exactly. It's, not, it's never great. More often than not, the paths in our life are never, there's a straight B line. Here's going to be some detours. Oh yeah. Life is a winding road. Oh yeah. 
Sometimes it's also a highway, but it's That's still, true. <laughs> I hear <laughs> still a winding road. And then what do you like to do outside the office? Um, a lot of different things. So this past year I started to get into, uh, 3d printing. Oh, really? What material? So, uh, PLA, there you uh, go. ABS and PETG. So, oh, perfect. Uh, I got, my first printer was an Ender 3 and I got it because it was insanely cheap and people said, oh, you can mod it to be the best printer, mm -hmm. which they're not wrong. Yeah. It's a good printer. Yeah. Um, and I did do some upgrades, but I wasn't getting the satisfaction, mm -hmm. I guess, or the right. It, was the detail just not articulate enough or in terms of the specifications or how detailed I can make the creations or what was enough to spec or to your, to your satisfaction? Um, I didn't like, so uh, the bed always got out of level and oh. I did not like that you had to manually level it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the hot end, it wasn't an all metal hot end. So you all you could do was PLA. Oh, really? Unless you want, like, because PLA depending on the brands. Now I use Hatchbox, mm. which is a really good brand. There's also Eson and Polymaker. Mm. They have additives and stuff like that that makes PLA, ABS, PETG printing a lot easier and it can be printed by a lot of different printers. Mm. But um, you need to have the temperature. So PLA anywhere from like 180 to like 220. And Hatchbox, its melting point is actually right around 190. So I print at 195. Mm -hmm. So I don't even hit 220 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, but ABS and PETG starting out, it's like 230 degrees Celsius. Oh. And you can't get those temperatures unless you have an all metal hot end. Uh, which depending on what printing you have could set you back a hundred or maybe even 200 bucks because you've got to get all the stuff for it and, and that's even saying your motherboard supports it. Yeah. And then if the firmware you got on it supports it too, if not, then you got to jailbreak it. Oh, geez. <laughs> so yeah, it's moddable for a reason and it's for a certain type of market. Yeah. But, uh, so I didn't like that. I went and I bought an anchor make, uh, M five C. That is probably one of the best bed slingers is what, because the bed moves. Oh really? Oh yeah. So, there's many different types of printers, uh, but uh, one of the common ones are bed slingers mm -hmm. where the bed moves and then you have, it moves this way and this way. So and it moves then, in all axes? Yes. Really? I, uh, I, all my friends have ones where the bed is stationary. So where you're printing that just little piece of metal, on the, on the, I was going to say the ground on the table, mm -hmm. doesn't move at all. Yeah. And then the head moves. Yeah. So um, different applications call for different types of printers and anchor make it's anchor. So sound core, their audio division, mm. their batteries, their, uh, plugs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So they got into the 3d printing business like a couple of years ago mm. and they've, they had the M five, which is big, mm. huge. Um, and that was their first printer and it fixed a lot of issues that a lot of people were having with manual printers mm. And allow people to actually get into the market because it was insanely cheap. I mean, six hundred bucks for a three D printer. It's pretty darn good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. now the Bamboo Lab uh, A one I think is uh, right around six hundred bucks. But you also have the X one Carbon, which is, has a built in AMS system, which is really nice. What's AMS for folks who don't print? Um, AMS. I don't remember what the actual terminology is, but basically it's a multi filament extruder. So you can have, well, depending on the AMS and to how many uh, filament rolls you can hold, uh, and if the software supports it, uh, it has it extrudes the right filament at the right time, and it really? creates filament poop. So it'll purge for you, mm -hmm. push the new filament in, and then it'll print. So you build your design, you three D CAD it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can use um, Tinkercad mm -hmm. to make your design, and it's free. And then you can go into Bamboo Lab Studio, their application. And then when you load it up, uh, it has all the areas cut out to where you can just select and you can select a color. And that your color is in tray one, mm -hmm. tray two, tray three, tray four. 
and um, it'll do it for you. So it'll print a solid piece. It'll have all the colors in it. It, it, it takes longer, yeah. but it is a really good system. And if you get high quality filaments, you can, you can basically make your own Etsy shop you know, yeah. and pump things out. It's uh, the Bamboo Labs printers are amazing. There's other printers that have AMS systems, and then you can build your own AMS system if you're into engineering and you can do the, the soldering and all that other stuff. And if you're willing to uh, jailbreak your printer, yeah, well, not really jailbreak it. There's some custom firmware that can be installed uh, on some printers if it's out there to support an AMS system. Or you can manually do it yourself, but... Like you have to have the timing perfect and you got to be there and it's just annoying. All right. But, um, anchor is actually coming out with their own AMS system that has six extruders, six, six. Holy. Then the thing is, how big is that? It, yeah, it's huge. (laughs) Um, I was looking at at it and, uh, I kind of want it, Yeah. (laughs) but not, not for like, whatever the price point is. I mean, maybe down the road, but, um, anchors printers, they're really good for starting out. Mm -hmm. They, uh, had a revision to the M five. It's the M five C it's got no screen. It's, it's got no AI, no camera, none of that stuff, Mm -hmm. but, uh, everything you can do from an app on your phone or from the studio app on your computer. I know, right. (laughs) Uh, they added a bunch of features into it and I've been pumping out prints like crazy. I made custom, uh, stocking tag holders for my family. Oh, really? Which hopefully they're not going to watch this before I give it to them because I haven't seen them for Christmas yet. Oh, no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> uh, I made a bunch of other stuff too, uh, like gnomes for my aunt. Oh, really? Yeah, the they're they're ornaments. So uh, I took a stencil, and well, when I say I took a stencil, I used AI to create a stencil. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, ChatGPT with Dolly yeah. or Microsoft's Copilot, uh, MidJourney as well. I mean, uh, different prompts and stuff like that. You get different uh, perspectives, and, and each AI ha- gives you different content, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I, I have the AI create the basic stencil of what I'm looking for, and then I draw it in Illustrator. And then I export it out to an SVG and then I put it in the Tinkercad and then I do the rest that I need to do. And then I pump it into my slicer and then print it out. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, it's actually really easy to do. I've made, uh, I made switch cartridge holders. Oh yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I've made, um, USB holders, and right now I'm actually working on designing uh, Xbox battery holders. Oh, really? I was, uh, my cat ended up puking on my TV stand, and so when I went to clean it up, I opened up the drawer just to check to see if there was any puke in there. And I'm like, I was counting, I'm like, I have 12 Xbox batteries. 12? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, they only last for like three to four hours, so I didn't want to just plug them in and keep them plugged in, yeah. uh, you know, to charge while I'm playing. So I'll just pop it out and pop another one in. It's quick and easy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I use a controller on my PC as well, and I have the wireless Xbox one, and I'm just mm-hmm. like, okay, I need to place these somewhere where they're just not in a drawer, because yeah. I know that... Uh, I'm going to lose these. Oh, yeah. That's, that's where stuff goes to get lost. It's the junk drawer. It's exactly. like you have that thing you need, but it's under like 12 layers of random stuff. So I looked on Thingiverse. I looked on cults and things and all this other stuff. I haven't found something that I like. So I'm in the process of designing like an Xbox Series X themed uh, battery holder where you pop the top off and you plug your batteries in and you put it in. That'd be pretty cool. Now, if I could figure out how to charge them. <laughs> yes, that'll be the next step. First step is getting the design, seeing if it works. Second step is the engineering. That's where you have to worry about, you know, adding extra space for wires and make sure it doesn't burn the place down, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, burning the place down. Probably the downside. Yeah. Does it cost innovation, though? Yes. <laughs> um, surprisingly, 3D printing is incredibly fun and insanely cheap. It's- You're probably your biggest expense is the printer. But yep. if you do a lot of research, uh, YouTube... I mean, I've, I have an entire playlist of, you know, 3D people. Oh, really? Printed people. And 
one channel that I liked a lot is the next layer. And he goes over some really weird stuff. Like he built uh, an entire honeycomb wall to hold all of his tools and stuff. And it's incredibly sturdy. Really? It's in, yes. Uh, and he's got drills and a bunch of stuff. He built a filament spool rack that drops down that he can just t- tap into his printers and it retracts back. That's pretty cool automatically and i'm just like okay that's awesome it's like a q from james bond or batman like right? that's that's convenient and functional that's that's pretty cool so um in that regards yes i have a lot of fun with that i just started into it this past year mm-hmm. and uh i'm hoping that i continue with it and come up with more designs um which i uh, my friend and i we also got a laser engraver oh really so uh, we've been. What kind do you get? Uh, it's the X tool. It's the one that's like a thousand dollars, but yeah. we uh, got it on Amazon Prime Day for Prime Day for like fifty percent off. Oh wow, really? Oh yeah, that's pretty good. It was probably one of the best purchases we've made because we've cut wood, we've cut things with it, we've etched wood, we've made oh, nice. coasters for a bunch of people. Yeah, uh, we've been experimenting with it, and uh, I'm going to 3D print an enclosure for it so we can uh, do uh, a filtration system because some of the stuff that you etch into, it actually burns and the oh, yeah? smell smells really bad. Oh, yeah. So a filtration system. I, I saw some of these, and they're like thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I could probably 3D print one. Oh, yeah. The biggest expense would really be the industrial fan or the motor. Oh, If you break yeah. down the raw materials, like what goes into those? You, yeah. Um, the bit, the cool thing about the X1, the X tool, is um, you can etch tumblers with it. Oh, really? Well, glass, tumblers, a bunch yeah. of other stuff. And it, you get the rotary attachment. And, uh, I mean, you can get... Uh, Yeti cups that have the vinyl plastering or oh, even yeah. powder coated. Well, I don't know if it can cut through powder coat, but it should be able to. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's also a lot of fun. Absolutely. Um, and uh, what's the favorite thing that you've done thus far with the laser engraver? With the laser engraver, uh, I designed a peacock inspired uh coaster design i guess Mm -hmm. uh for one of my friends i haven't actually made the coaster yet Mm -hmm. uh well i've made prototypes of the coaster i haven't actually finalized the prototype but uh basically she wanted her name which uh in it with a peacock and a bunch of other stuff around it and so uh, i meticulously hand drew in illustrator Oh, really? Uh, a peacock. I, yeah. I got a peacock image from Google, and then I'm like, I kind of want to do a wall art with this. Yeah. And so the uh, first couple of coaster designs did not go well. Yeah. <laughs> but trial and error. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I think I have one that she might actually like. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe in the next couple of weeks, I'll get it uh, etched and send it out to her and see if she likes it. What kind of material? Are you going to put that on wood or slate or cork or? So um, I have a lot of slate and also I have a lot of spare wood lying around. Well, my friend does actually, but um, I'm thinking about doing slate. And if she wants something else, uh, there's a really good woodworking store where my friend lives that has um, a lot of cool small um, planks, I guess, that we can turn into coasters. Mm -hmm. So we could do something like that as well. That'd be pretty cool. Do you think you'll ever get into metal 3D printing? I know the barrier to entry to that category is still like ridiculously high, I think. Metal 3D printing is completely different. It's yeah. basically Additive using... Additive manufacturing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, it's better than CNC metal. Uh, yeah. It. The process is really hard to explain and define, but basically it takes lasers mm-hmm. and it has metal that the lasers hit to basically print an image and yeah. it's in sand or a, a powder composite basically that, uh, I know Inconel is one of the most popular forms. Of yes. These. And so those you right now, the only material that I know of that is really cost effective is aluminum. And so a company really? PCB way, mm-hmm. 
they have a whole bunch of stuff, uh, you know, like electronics and stuff like that, but they also 3D print. They can do FDM. I believe they can do resin. And they also do metal printing. Oh, really? And uh, oh, they have the aluminum option. And one of the guys that I follow on YouTube, he built an entire Iron Man suit. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, he's actually built several. And he used parts from PCB Way, and he built an Iron Man arc reactor. Uh, it it was metal 3D printed. Oh, really? And it actually works. It's got a contact pin. It goes in. It powers the suit? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it lights up yeah, the yeah. suit. Yeah. But um, it's really cool how he did it, and he showed this whole process using PCB Way. Mm -hmm. And I kind of do want to get into that. Maybe not the metal part because that's probably going to be expensive overhead, but eventually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, like like most things in life, the price point will eventually go down. So like I know industrial engineering, they use it everywhere. I know like Boeing is doing some crazy phenomenal things. See with Lockheed Martin for aerospace and defense where they're 3D printing full metal parts, not just for prototypes, but for actual machines that they're selling to the government. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, but again, those machines that they used to make those are, you know, like cost more in the house in a lot of cases. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> that'll so, probably cost. <laughs> uh, Eliglo, Eligu, I hope I'm saying that right. They have a printer that is basically a size of a car that oh, can geez. fit in the garage. It's on Kickstarter right now. I think it's like for two to three grand. That's uh, for the, for to buy it? That's pretty aggressive for that technology. Yeah, but Eligo is really good printers. Yeah. Um, their Neptune line is pretty good. Um, I mean, you have also Creality, and there, there's different, I mean, the Ender models and stuff like that, there's different ones. Um, and you have Voron and Prusa, mm -hmm. uh, which those are for a different type of audiences. And th don't get me wrong, the Prusa printers, they look awesome. Yeah. I don't know if I could spend the money on them. Where do those start at? Uh, I think one of them that I saw the price point was like 800, but that's like the bare minimal of it. Really? Um, but they have a lot of attachments. They have enclosures, they have other stuff that goes with it. So it, it's worth it. And they're really good printers. They're exceptional. I mean, I've not talked to a person that has a Prusa printer and they've not said one bad thing about it. It's like, yeah, I don't have to do anything to it. It just works. And for that price point, yeah, I would expect it just oh, yeah. to work. <laughs> but, um, you know, other people will say, yeah, I've got, you know, I've got this Bamboo Lab or I've got, you know, this Neptune or I've got this Creality. And, I, you know, I'm having some issues. Like, I even was having issues with the, with the Ender 3. Oh, really? Which is ex it, it's expected. I mean, if you're starting out, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where to go to for help. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's expected, but if you're consistently having the same issue, yeah. uh, is it a design flaw is or manufacturing it? flaw, material flaw? Like yeah. there, there's a reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, are, it's at that point of, are you doing something wrong or is the printer just faulty? Yeah, exactly. But I've never heard anybody say anything bad about Prusa or Voron printers. Mm -hmm. uh, Voron printers. Yeah. They're pretty cool. If you had an unlimited budget, what would you get tomorrow? If I had an unlimited budget. Uh, I would probably go with the bamboo. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I would buy like eight or ten bamboo X1 carbons or even the bit bigger ones and use that because out of the box, they just work. Yep. The tensioners are set. Uh, the auto leveling, it's set. You know, um, the hot end is just perfect to print any material. And with the added bonus of a built-in AMS system, yeah, I... Uh, I would spend that price point. I would get those because you can design the bamboo lab slicer. Mm -hmm. It gives you plates and you can design, you can put your stencils or your STLs on different plates and you can send it to different printers at the same time. Really? Yes. That's pretty cool. And they're all connected. Yeah. That's, that's pretty unique. Yes. Now, I mean, I would experiment with other printers obviously, and I may get a garage size printer, but yeah. <laughs> No, those would probably be my go-to because I can just design it, send it to the printer. It does its thing, and I can have it automated, and it just works. Yeah. I, th I was going to say, speaking of your garage, I think you said you're a pretty big gearhead as well? Uh, so, yes and no. I like cars. I like to work on cars. Uh, not so much when I was a kid. Yeah. It's, of course, different passion. But now I'm 
you know, I love working on my own vehicles. Uh, I love going over to my father's house and my uncle's house and working on cars and stuff like that and talk about car things. We have our own signal chat and we, we talk about a lot of things, but <laughs> primarily cars is one of them. Uh, let's see. I have a 2010 F-150. Oh, nice. It's the Super Crew Cab. Yeah. Gunmetal gray. It's, nice. It's uh, probably one of the best trucks to have because it was my stepfather's. Oh, nice. Uh, it's the car that I learned how to drive. Really? Oh, it's cool. Uh, and it's saved me from a really, really horrible accident. Oh, really? Really bad accident. Mm -hmm. And the truck took a beating. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It was still drivable. Like, you couldn't even tell it was in an accident. Uh, that is, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about the F-150s is, I mean, if Ford, ever, if Ford ever made a good product, it's the F-150. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why they stopped making pretty much all the cars. It's like, well, you know what? We do trucks well. We're going to just make even more of them. It's the best-selling truck in history, too. It's the F-150 series. Oh. Or the F-100 series. I know it counts all of them together with the sales. but Yeah. Uh, I mean, I want a Mustang. Yeah. I mean, everybody's like, yeah, I want a Challenger. I want, I want this. I want well, that. too late now. They're dead. <laughs> the new Challenger is going to be straight six and electric. Yeah. And it's an interesting conversion. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how well it will do, but yeah. it's they're basically pulling a Ford where they're just turning it into a brand like the Mustang Mach-E. Which don't yeah. get me wrong. The technology is cool. I just don't, I, I don't think establishing a pony with an SUV is a good idea. No, I, it's, so I've, I, it's one of those things where I think they did because they, they knew it was the most powerful name they have. And they, they think, well, hilariously, now they're backtracking. But they thought the electric was the future as of, of you know, depending on when this airs, the most recent news from Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, is, oh, yeah, we're going to copy Toyota, which was we're going to focus more on hybrids because that's the biggest growing category. But yeah, they went all in for the Mustang. I almost throw up my mouth when I say it. The Mustang e -Mach. Because again, there's nothing wrong with new technology, new vehicles. But it's the brand of the legacy of the Mustang and calling it that. And I think it's safe to say, that, I mean, Ford won the Pony Wars. Because mm -hmm. the Challenger's dying. And the Camaro, which sold, even though they sold 2X in 2023 compared to 2022. It's one of those things. The Camaro is now going to be converted to an EV two-door SUV. The, I almost died a little inside saying that. It's just, there's something iconic about the, it's just something iconic, again, about the Mustang. And unlike the competition, they never stopped making it. Like the Camaro and the Challenger, they stopped making those a couple mm -hmm. times. Mustang's always been there. It's had, Mustang's had some rough years, don't get me wrong, when the EPA knee, kneecapped them a couple times, but it's always been there. Yeah, um, their design, the design of it has also been a, uh, not necessarily a show shopper, show stopper at times, but yeah. uh, very interesting as well. I mean, the Camaros have always looked like a Camaro. Yeah. Yeah. Did did they beef up a little bit? Did they slim down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Challengers, they've had the same body style for eons. <laughs> yeah, since inception. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll say take more risk. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Camaro and the Impala, mm -hmm. I mean, the Impala. When you think of Impala, do you not think of Supernatural? Yeah, I was going to say, there's that brand yeah. connection or the yeah. power placement, yeah. And then now it's just a a, a four-door sedan. Oh, it's... I mean, it used yeah. to be an iconic muscle car. So, it's, it's so sad because so many of those cars were like that, too. It's like what used to be. Like, you look at old pictures of, like, parking lots of high schools in the 70s and the 80s. Like, oh, my gosh, we we used to have so much and took it so for granted. Like, the Chevelle SS... Like people laughed like, oh, it's a, basically a family car. It's like, now it's a collectible. And well, partially th thanks to the provenance of Fast and Furious making it more popular again. But it's just like now, I mean, there's so much engineering that went into those vehicles. Like mm -hmm. so underrated. And it, Mustangs are just fun to drive too. And they, yeah. There's engine note, is the exhaust note is just beautiful. Uh, I, my dream car would probably be a Shelby GT500. Vintage or new? Um... It depends. Like, I want vintage. Like, I want a 69. Yeah. Though, I mean, they look really good. But my mom's Mustang is a 2010, mm -hmm. and it's basically like a bullet fastback. Oh, really? It, it, it's got the bullet shape, yeah. and it's got the fastback look in the back. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, it looks a little how, bit more. How many pedals does she get? Don't mind me asking. How many pedals? Got to ask. 
Uh, well, it's a six. It's not a six, uh, but it's a five on the floor. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a V four. Uh, and then it's got clutch, right? I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. yes, it does have a as, all, as all Mustangs. I would, I would debate as all cars should, but <laughs> well, and see, uh, mom wanted that Mustang, uh, as a standard. I mean, yeah. back then Ford was offering the same price point for like a fully loaded Mustang close to a fully loaded. Yeah. But, uh, I, I remember her and my dad just going around different places, different Fords, trying to look for a Mustang. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's had Mustangs before. Mm -hmm. Um, she had like three. Oh, wow. Really? When three since I've been born. Yeah. Um, but she's also had a few before I was born. Um, so she went looking for that car. Yeah. And it is still brand new. I mean, up until recently, it had the original tires on it. Uh, oh, my it, gosh. Serious? Yeah. Very low mileage, stuff like that. It's still in pristine condition. Uh, we did we did a little bit of modification to it. Mm -hmm. But because, um, you know, the V4s or the V6s, they don't sound the same. The same. Yeah. Put a boiler, but, boiler exhaust on there or something, maybe? Uh, I don't know which exhaust my dad put on there, but when you fire it up, it sounds like a Mustang. It, it's yeah. not it, it's not too whiny, mm -hmm. but it's got just enough throat to it that it's just like, yeah, that's a Mustang. Oh, yeah. Um, and it sounds really good. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are times back when I was younger, uh, you know, mom and I we would just go for a drive. Yeah. It's like we'll we'll take a Sunday drive. Yeah, it, it wasn't a convertible, mm -hmm. but it was it all black, all black interior. Nice. Um, and it just it rode smooth. Yeah, and it's just I've always had that same infatuation that my mom has. So yeah. whether it's a new or an old one, I don't know. I I like the 2016 models. Those are good. Yeah, really good. A lot of power. A lot of power. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if I could go for a vintage model, I will. Yeah. I mean, depending on the price point, I will. They have a couple, they have a lot, I was going to say, of all the cars that they make it, they've made kits for, that's probably the number one in terms mm -hmm. of old Chevrolet's. They actually, you hear about the, the, not the knockoff, the, not the restoration, but like a refresh that they did two or three years ago. Where um, it was like the carbon fiber kit. Yes. Like fully authorized. This is exactly like the one from the 60s. But we made the body out of carbon fiber, and I think the starting price was $1 million. It's like, insane. I can't imagine driving that. Because it's, I mean, it's basically just an engine with wheels. Like, that's got to weigh nothing. Um, Ford has come up with some interesting things, hmm. uh, especially with the Mustangs. Oh, yeah. Um, but I don't know. The way things are going, going i don't know if the mustang will be around by the time that i'm looking to have a project car <laughs> that's the sad thing is well i i mean we got to respect ford in terms of they won the pony wars i say that because the camaro is dead i mean the challenger is dead ford still got the options and i don't know there's a lot of controversy when they came out with the inline four engine for the mustang because obviously i mean a lot of people mustang by default should have a v8 and a stick shift and i tend to agree but i mean they're giving you the options at different price points I and mean, I don't know if I was if I was Jim Farley, I'd keep that thing alive as long as possible, partially because partially for market differentiation. All the other companies are acquiescing to more electronic vehicles, getting rid of the option of stick shifts. I mean, General Motors, they don't have the Camaro's dead. The Corvette is automatic only. That's going to have an electric option as well as a hybrid option. So, and I know Cadillac has a CT4, CT5, V Blackwing. They have stick shifts, but Cadillac will be full EV by 2030 if Mary Barra has her roadmap according to her wishes. So, I mean, in terms of a Musk car with a stick shift, Ford basically has a monopoly, and the sales figures are always pretty strong for the Mustang. There's some rough years throughout, you know. But I think the tailpipe emissions, that's what will force Ford to maybe kill it eventually. But they're also offsetting, because I was going to say, for the folks who aren't gearheads or, I guess, business nerds, the government has tailpipe emission standards or fleet averages, so that's why they're making more EVs, so they could increase, increase their fleet averages or actually decrease the emissions, all that kind of stuff. So that's why Ford, partially that's why they're making so many EVs, so they can keep the V8 alive in that regard. And I think more consumers are pushing back. You see the biggest growing category is hybrid. So I think I think Ford will be one of the last ones to give up the stick shift and the V8. I hope so. I mean, 
Uh, I'm one of those people that don't know how to, I do know how to drive standard. I yeah. just not comfortable driving standard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I had a project car, like my dad did, or my stepfather did, or even my mom did, that was standard. And that's how they learned how to drive. I yeah. probably would have been, uh, more inclined to standard, but, uh, when I was learning how to drive, it was my dad's truck or my mom's car Mustang. Yeah. And you know, my mom's not going to let, let me try to drive yeah. that. Yeah. I was about to say, do you ever sneak it out? Like I'd be so tempted. Be uh, like, oh. When I got my driver's <laughs> license and after the first two years, my mom tried to teach me, Yeah, but it was this weird dynamic of trying to learn from my mom mm -hmm. to teach me how to do something. And I couldn't just never grasp the concept. Yeah. Um, and when my dad would try to teach me, it was like a different concept. And so, um, and of course it was a Mustang and I, it's a lot of power. Uh, my dad will blame me for burning out the clutch on it and which <laughs> partially, I mean, I was trying to learn how to drive on it, but yeah. also, I mean, was it me that was hot dogging? I'm just going to yeah. say. <laughs> so there's blame all around. Yeah. I'm sure there's a little lead foot in the family. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think electric vehicles is probably, it's a good direction to take a peek at. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if it's the best direction. Uh, it's always kind of like most technology and products. There's a, there's a place for it. I mean, you could debate the whole green debate is it better for the environment when you take into the total life cycle of the vehicle? That's a debate in and of itself. And then there's the say there's the you know, there's safeties where in terms of well, if you have a Tesla, it's basically a computer on wheels, they can adjust I mean, the amount of technology they can put in to prevent accidents and to adjust even the airbag, even how hard the airbag goes mm -hmm. off, depending on the driver and the passenger's weight and their size. I mean, it's phenomenal and it's fascinating. But I don't know, to me I'm an old soul. I've only ever owned stick shifts. I mean my dream car will be, will be a couple stick shifts. And another thing that concerns me about EVs in particular is the right to repair. Mm -hmm. And they are becoming computers on wheels, which again, there are a lot of benefits, but you can't have an independent mechanic in most areas repair it or fix it or modify it. It's just like yeah. the John Deere thing. Oh yeah, a lot of people don't realize like farmers used to love John Deere. A lot of these, I mean, you buy a good Kubota tractor or you know, Case, Case New Holland, I mean, some of those things will last your lifetime and partially farmers want to be able to repair it because not all times, but many times farmers are in remote locations. Mm -hmm. And just like a data center, they don't, they can't have downtime where they have to send in the tractor for, you know, months to get fixed. They got to harvest, they got to hustle, they got to work. And yet some manufacturers are trying to lock them in and not allow them to repair the vehicle, the re expensive vehicles they purchase. I mean, mm -hmm. people don't realize, realize tractors and those things are much they're, they're expensive, more expensive than some houses. Yep, and technology is great until it fails. And exactly. it will inevitably fail. And I mean, there's more there's more computer components in, in today's cars than there was in the Apollo mission. It's insane. I always tell people in terms of reliability, I kind of think cars kind of peaked maybe in the 2000s into Japanese engineering. Mm -hmm. You read all the articles like, what cars have hit a million miles? An overwhelming majority of the time is a Toyota or it is a Honda mm -hmm. from that era. I mean, my family, another thing I would appreciate about the internal combustion engine, well, people always say you want to care about everyone, people with low, low, lower income. Well, they, they need something that will give them an ROI or not depreciate too much or gonna like be reliable for a long time. My family still drives, and they bought it new, a 2001 Honda Accord. Still drives and still runs like a champ because it's simple Japanese engineering. And there wasn't a lot of computer technologies, which again, there are downsides because there's less safety features. And, you know, <laughs> excuse me. So there's, uh, the wise man once said, there's no solutions, there's only trade-offs. And that's very true in that regard. But I mean, the only, I know the uh, fun little fact of the day, the most longest running car in history hit over 3 million miles. And it was a Volvo from the sixties. Wow. So that's, that's one outlier is little Swedish engineering was able to sneak their way onto the record board. <laughs> I wonder what the maintenance would have looked like on that. I want to see if they kept records. That's a crazy thing about, especially Toyotas. Again, I'm not a mechanic. Don't take my advice. <laughs> like you can't, it's, it's almost like you can't break him. It's almost like a comic. Like every time you had a top gear, or some of those, you know, little review shows, every t durability test, they beat the crap out of it. And at the end of the day, it still runs, which mm -hmm. is why Toyota is one of the most successful automotive companies in history. And it's also one of those things where I, for their brand, I don't, again, 
controversial statement. That's actually why the old the grandson, who was a previous CEO last year's, one of the reasons he would be, went to sort of being CEO, went to the board of directors was he was more conservative in terms of the business outlook. He did he was a little uneasy about the EVs. And that's why Lexus was more EV than Toyota. Granted, they own Lexus. He was more focused on Toyota. But as long as this is where, if you want the most reliable vehicle on the planet, with the current technology we have, and a little caveat, we work in IT, we could have very well have a battery technology that comes out tomorrow that will last 100 years. We're, we are experimenting with sodium-based batteries. It, a lot of fantastic technologies. But in terms of, if you want a reliable vehicle, you buy a Toyota Corolla. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the most successful vehicle in history ever sold. It's just simple technology that's been proven, and they just perfected it over years. But it's just one of those things where there's trade-offs. <laughs> well, I mean, it's also just like Volkswagen do. I mean, they do all their experimental with experimental stuff with Audi. I oh, mean, yeah. all, all the new Audis that come out, they have the latest and greatest engines, the specs. They're yeah. fast. They're amazing. Um, but, you know, in terms of reliability, it's a hit or miss. Yep. Uh, but it's really good engineering. Volkswagens, I mean, they're... Their standard cars, their Jettas, their Passats, their Golfs, they're, it, yeah, they're based off of known good technology. They yeah. they experimented with Audi. Did it work? Did it not? Okay, cool. Then they transitioned in. I mean, Jettas nowadays, they can go, you know, well over 100 miles per hour and still maintain 30 miles to the gallon. It's astonishing. I mean, talk about German engineering. They make some of the best products. And a lot of people realize Volkswagen basically, have, oh, unfortunately, well, I kind of like the I have the idea of having engineering so good you can get the most fuel economic car, economic car on the planet as well as make the fastest car on the planet with the same talent pool. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it's like lately they've been divesting some of those brands. But like, wind back when Peach was CEO a couple of years ago, I mean, they had Lamborghini, Ducati, Bugatti. You have Porsche. Lam I mean, they had all those under their belt. And the amount of things that they create is, they're just astronomical. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the Volkswagen Auto Group. It, yeah. It, I mean, the conglomerate that it is, it's amazing what they have under their belt and what Volkswagen is, you know, able to accomplish. I mean, I kind of do wish that American companies would, you know, like GM or Ford and stuff like that had that same innovation spirit, that same passion yeah. of, okay, well, we have another brand that's well known. Let's experiment with, let's see what works and what doesn't work. And then we can transition it to another brand like Ford has Lincoln. Yeah, and my uncle bought a uh, a brand new Lincoln, and it's got everything, and it's yeah. the most reliable vehicle that he has. Yeah. But you know, it also took, you know, Ford engineering on their side to build that Lincoln. Oh yeah, and it's, uh, I guess it it it, it switched because now Lincoln is considered the luxury brand, and Ford's yep. considered the the normal brand. Well, it's fascinating to see automotive trends. And it's sad that Chrysler went bankrupt so bad they were bought out by Fiat. And now it's all been rebranded to uh, Stellantis, which is one of the mm -hmm. largest automotive companies. With They own a lot of the brands, including Maserati and all that. But as one of those things where, I mean, back in the day, a truck used to be a cheap, a truck used to be cheaper than cars. And it was just a functional thing. Mm -hmm. Now trucks cost more than the house. Some of them are going over $100,000 for a, 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 it's a truck. Uh, I was <laughs> looking at, uh, just, you know, just looking at, yeah. at new trucks. And I was looking at Ford and, uh, you know, I'm kind of like keen to the lightning. I think it's a cool idea and stuff like that, but oh, yeah. it's like over a hundred thousand dollars. That's before dealer markup. Uh, yeah. That, that's, that's what's kill. That's another thing that's killing the big three. The big three being the largest, well, they used to be the biggest and baddest, awesome automotive companies. They own Detroit is, you know, Chrysler it was Ford and General Motors. And they have the dealerships that are, some debate necessary either because you need someone locally that could help your consumers out with maintenance mate, and all that kind of stuff and upkeep. But p consumers are getting pissed at the markups. When the F 150 Lightning first came out, again, that's their EV pickup truck. I mean, there's some dealers that were marking up over $100,000. So you had the MSRP, which if you sell a car for MSRP, the dealers make a pretty good profit at that point mm -hmm. already. But they're selling it over, I think actually one day actually I also tried for $150,000 on top of MSRP. And that, and well, Ford's actually trying to do something about that because the dealer markup and some of these Ford dealerships are just astronomical. I mean, 20, 30, 40% over MSRP. Yeah. I mean, and the, the vehicles are not even worth that because no. as soon as you drive it, you are, you depreciate more yeah. than half of the vehicle. Oh, especially in those cases. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's one of those things where they, it's a very unusual relationship because they also like the dealers because the dealers are the ones that are writing them checks. Mm -hmm. So 
when you see when you know General Motors sold a hundred thousand, I was going to say hundred thousand dollars. It's like one vehicle these days. But if they sold you know twenty trucks, well, they sold them to the dealerships, which is what they kind of rely on the dealerships for. Especially if they're publicly traded, they need their fiscal quarters to be strong. They'll lean on the dealerships to be like, hey, I need you to we need Q4. We need to sell some extra stuff. Well, the vehicle isn't really sold to the consumer. Then it's on the con it's on the dealership lot. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of conflict of interest because like they got they kind of have to be friends with the dealerships, but at the same time, some of these dealerships. I mean, they're just doing crazy markups, and I also blame who who is paying these markups too. Like, someone's buying that Dodge Challenger Demon SRT XY Banana Falcon, whatever they call it, for like three hundred fifty grand. Mm -hmm. They're paying it now. Don't get me wrong. In terms of engineering, I love the idea of their la and again, it's kind of a hoorah to the last Challenger. It was the fastest. It's the fastest car on the planet, technically zero to sixty in one point six six seconds, and that's from a good old V eight American Muscle. That is. Awesome. I can't imagine how hard those engineers had to hustle to make that happen. But now it is kind of sad. Most of them are going to be treated as investment portfolios. They'll be put a little dust cover over it. But some dealers, a lot of these it's consistent dealers are asking over a hundred thousand dollars over MSRP. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, uh, and it's insane because then they're wondering why we have they have all these vehicles on the lot. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times dealerships kill a product. Like one of the one of my favorite four vehicles ever made. I almost bought one, but I. Uh, Hilariously, I didn't buy it because I thought it'd be unreliable. And if it turns out the uh, the very hardworking employees at the factory who were making the Ford Focus ST, they accidentally used a Mustang gasket on the ST engine. And of course, that caused it to leak leak all over and do terrible things. Oh, the easy fuel thing? Yeah. But my favorite thing that Ford did make at the time was the Ford Focus RS, which was really cool. Hot hatch. It was a rally car, right? Yeah, rally car for the consumer. But the dealerships destroyed it because they treated it like a Lamborghini. They roped it off so you couldn't test drive it. They marked it up by 15 grand. And you just get to that price point, and you're like, I'm not going to get that. Like the Honda Civic. I love my Honda Civic SI. It only comes with a stick shift, as every vehicle should. But it's one of those things where I bought mine as a Gen 10. Now that the newer Gen is out, now it's, that's post-pandemic. Um, they're doing the markups. These dealerships are marking them up 10 grand for an SI and 15 grand for a Type R. So you're, if you want a Type R, which again, great engineering, a great vehicle, I would argue at the MSRP price, but by the time you pay the dealer markup, plus don't forget the government got tax title mm -hmm. registration, you're spending about $70,000 for Honda Civic Type That's R. Insane. And at that price point, you know what? A used Corvette or used Porsche with a stick shift looks pretty good. So they're alienating those customers, actually moving those customers to a different product category because it's a different price point. So, I mean, there's a lot of people getting fed up with dealerships, but again, you do need those local relationships to fix, maintain, and repair the vehicles. But I know Mercedes, they're trying to make it so that the dealers are legally considered agents. So that way they just get paid a flat fee no matter what they sell, and then you still get that local, you know, service and parts. So it's interesting, but yeah, going back to the, sorry, my ADHD is terrible, with the big, <laughs> three, with the big three and where they innovate, they're having less resources to innovate because their costs are more. I mean, GM has the highest labor cost Some crazy how the vehicles aren't as reliable as others, but nevertheless, they are some of the highest labor costs for their vehicles. And that means you have less resources because at the end of the day, unlike the government, not to get into that, but these businesses have a finite number of resources and you know, you have to have trade-offs with the, okay, if we have this costs as much to make a car, got to decrease the price unit, your labor is already going up. So they don't have as much money to innovate. I mean, you read about John Morris and Billy Durant founded the company by combining Buick and Oldsmobile back in the day. They made some astronomically fantastic, cool products, but it's just a resource allocation. I think they just, and nowadays, you know, a new vehicle is a billion dollar bet with all the infrastructure and everything you need to put into it. It's, it's a huge thing. <laughs> it is. So I was going to say ADHD, last ADHD question. If you have one, I was going to say, what's your dream vehicle? One vintage and one new. So vintage would be that Mustang. Yeah. If I can. Yeah. There's. You know, no doubt about it. I would, I would pull the, whatever resources I could at that time to get it. Um, new, I don't know. I mean, there's not a lot of vehicles that really interest me. I mean, I, I if I'm looking to have like a 30-car garage, sure, there's a ton of vehicles that fit that list. Yeah. But as something that would be affordable and be my daily driver, mm -hmm. I don't know. I kind of want to get another truck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Ford will always have my heart, uh, but, you know, I also want to branch out, you know, uh, Toyota Tundras, they're really good. Darn your bulletproof too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, Cybertruck, but oh, yeah, that's true. That's, that's insane. 
and, uh, and bulletproof, literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. Uh, but uh, so Toyota Trender would probably be the new one that I would go for. But I don't know. I mean, I'm always open to options. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, if you want to stick, if you ever want to go down that road, there's one truck in North America that has it now. Just one. Which truck? It's good the Toyota Sequoia. Or not the Sequoia. ADHD. Jeez Louise. The Sonoma? No. Oh. The, this is embarrassing. Not the toy. The Toyota Tundra is the larger one, the V6 twin turbo, or yeah, the V6 twin turbo. Oh, you're talking about Tacoma. The yeah, Sorry. T- yeah, yeah, the little one. Jeez Louise. <laughs> but yeah, that's one option left. So if I had to get a truck that I default, like I know it's a light duty truck, so you can't you know haul as much. But yeah, I, I, I might get one of those. And again, it's bulletproof. It's going to be Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the engineering on them, they're fantastic. I mean, they. I want to say that they're built to last, but of course, yeah. every. Every piece of equipment's going to have their failure points, but oh, yeah. Toyota seems to not have as many. Well, that failure point is so far out, you can't see it. It's yeah. hitting a million miles plus. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but, I mean, the maintenance on them too, oh, yeah. but eventually you'll get to a point to where your return is more than what you initially invested. Exactly. That's usually what all that counts. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Holly. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe, and comment, and share. Thanks so much for everyone. You stay safe. Have a great day.